This week on the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. Before you start writing your story, listen for the voice of your narrator, your main character, because that voice is going to tell the story. And once you can hear it, whether it's a he or she, young or old, it will help you tell that story. Read. Read the, the novels of those people you want to write like, you want to grow up to be like. Read very closely. Study them. Study the economy of creating characters. Study how they get in and out of scenes. Study the, the cliffhanger endings uh, of, of chapters that keep pages turning and keep the readers you know, wanting more. And just how a narrative thrust is created in the narrative. I mean, there, and, and this means looking at it the way a carpenter looks at a house very closely. Don't speed read. Just really study. Welcome to the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. News, interviews, and writing tips for people who are serious about having a writing career and want some practical knowledge to help them achieve it. Your host is the nationally best-selling author of more than 50 books, William Bernhardt. Hey, hello, sneakers. Welcome to our very special Independence Week episode of the podcast. I'm saying Independence Week, taking some liberties, but as we record this, it's coming after the fourth and the audio podcast will go out on sunday so it'll be several days after so i'm just making it independence week why not which comes on the heels of father's day my favorite for obvious reasons all the kids came together and we had alice made her tortilla soup we played games and in two days i'm leaving for eureka springs for a, a small group writing retreat come to think of it I met one of our two interview guests today for the first time many years ago in Eureka Springs at their annual literary conference, which is called Books in Bloom. That's when I discovered the Writer's Colony at Dairy Hollow and then started hosting retreats there. Well, anyway, in honor of the stellar talent that we have with us today on the podcast, not one but two sensational best-selling authors, I'm foregoing the usual news segment. In truth, there's not a whole lot of news happening this week, and I want to leave as much time as possible for our guests. But the one thing that I will never forego is my super special sound engineer, Jesse Ulrich. Jesse, how are you celebrating this holiday week? I just decided. Well, I every July 4th, I like as a former historian, I like to point out that we really should be celebrating this on July 2nd and not the 4th <laughs> anyway. But you and John Adams. Yep. Yeah, I'm a big John Adams fan. And <laughs> mostly I, I had one of the chillest Fourth of July's I've had in quite some time. We were just in uh, a friend's backyard watching a Captain America marathon that was on uh, FX, I think. On your and 65-inch television? I'm no, thinking. he had a TV outside. So yeah, <laughs> it was not as nice as my new watching it on my new TV. Uh, I will say those lights I told you about that like were changed depending on what's on the screen. I was watching uh, the 4K Lord of the Rings that I recently bought, and every time the ring is either mentioned or shown, the lights turn red, which I thought was a really nice touch. So oh, that was fun. Sounds cool. So this is the first time since we started live streaming these podcasts that we've had two guests at once. Do you think you're up to the challenge? Uh, let me Listen, I, I will do the best with what I am given in all situations. So no, <laughs> no matter what people uh, w- watching out there live now or listening to it a week from now, they're going to hear something amazing. I agree with that. Before we bring on our guests, let me remind everyone that we are, of course, still accepting registrations for WriterCon, which is our annual writers conference every year in Oklahoma City. It takes place over Labor Day weekend. That's September 3rd through 6th this year. There's the logo Jesse's got up on the screen. Hey, Labor Day weekend is closer than you might think. I was kind of shocked when I looked at the calendar today and saw that we're only about seven weeks away. And I normally spend pretty much all of August prepping the conference. So I need to get this book I'm writing finished really soon. (laughs) Anyway, back to WriterCon. You can come to WriterCon in person or you can stream the whole thing from home. We have over 60 presenters, writers, agents, publishers, editors, and much more attending. You can pitch, You can meet with people informally. You can have lunch with speakers. 
inner contests, and on and on and on. Our keynote speaker this year is David Farland, possibly the best writing instructor ever, other than Gary Braver, but more about that in just a minute. The program covers both fundamentals and all the latest things you need to know to break into or survive the modern publishing world. So please check it out. Visit writercon.org. That's W-R-I-T-E-R-C-O-N dot org and see if this might be the perfect thing to take your writing career to the next level. So today I have the great privilege of interviewing two authors. I know both, I read both, and I think both are among the very best writers working today. Tess Gerritsen, of course, has been writing spine-tingling thrillers since, I believe, 1987. She consistently hits the top of the bestseller list. Her series of novels featuring homicide detective Jane Rizzoli and medical examiner Mara Isles inspired the TV series Rizzoli and Isles. She's a medical doctor. I'm talking about Tess now, not the fiction characters. <laughs> She's a medical doctor, though I guess now retired and writing full time. But for her most recent book, Choose Me, she collaborated with another terrific author, Gary Braver, a great guy and great author with numerous award winning thrillers and other books as well. He's also a professor teaching writing and many other things at Northwestern, where students fight to get into one of his acclaimed classes. The new novel these two have written, Choose Me, was released last. Thursday, debuting in the number one bestseller spot everywhere, where it still is. I checked this morning, and I think that means they've probably sold a copy or two of this wonderful book. Tess, Gary, are you with me? Come join Here. the podcast. Hey, <laughs> hey guys, how you Hi. doing? Good. Right. Hi, Bill. <laughs> Good to see both of you. Okay. All right. Our traditional first question here on the podcast I will start with Tess because she's a bu it's a Brady Bunch type thing, and Tess is on top right now. So anyway, <laughs> Tess, if you could offer a writer one, and you could probably offer 20, but if you had to narrow it down to one piece of advice you were going to give this person, what would it be? Before you start writing your story, listen for the voice of your narrator, your main character, because that voice is going to... Tell the story, and once you can hear it, whether it's a he or a she, young or old, it will help you tell that story. But how do you find that voice? I know what people are wondering. That sounds great, but where do I find it? Well, you conjure it up in your head. It's just really, <laughs> because sometimes, um, and maybe you need a, an imagination, or maybe well, you, that just helps. To, uh, yeah, yeah. you just need to like let the universe come to you. But some of my best books, I think, started off with hearing um, a voice talking to me, uh, whether it was a child's <laughs> voice or it was a scared woman's voice, or it was a killer's voice. Hmm. All right, Gary, same question for you. One piece of writing advice, what's it going to be? Read. Read the, the novels of those people you want to write like, you want to grow up to be like. Read very closely. Study them. Study the economy of creating characters. Study how they get in and out of scenes. Study the the cliffhanger endings uh, of of chapters that like keep pages turning and keep right. the readers you know wanting more, and just how a narrative thrust is created in the narrative. I mean, there, and and this means looking at it the way a carpenter looks at a house very closely. Don't speed read. Just really study the the the, uh, the various strategies to keep you mm -hmm. turning the pages. Yeah, also great advice. Well, of course, I want to talk to both of you about this new book, Choose Me. But before we get there, I'd like to talk a little bit about how you got into this business and your path, because I know many of the people who are watching now or will listen later to this will be interested in how it happened. So, Tess, I'm going to start with you because you are really making me look bad. My parents <laughs> wanted me to be a doctor, and I said, no, I'm going to be a writer. But you did both. How did that happen? 
Well, the difference was I listened to my parents. <laughs> I, I wanted to be a writer when I was seven. And my dad said, oh, that's no way to make a living. You better go into medicine. So I followed my, I was a good girl and I went to medical school and I liked medicine, but I've always been a writer. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was, um, you know, I wrote all the way through, through medical school. And even in the, um, those long nights on call, uh, if I had a, a, an extra hour or something, I would scratch out something. Uh, so I got my big break when I went on maternity leave. Mm -hmm. um, I gave birth to my first son. He was a great sleeper. He would sleep <laughs> for two to three hours at a time. And that's when I started writing in earnest. So I wrote my first novel on maternity leave. Wow. Um, I always tell my sons, yeah, I, you know, I'm going to give you some credit, kids, for, for sleeping <laughs> so well. Um, and I think it was maybe my third novel that I sold. Um, you know, there's always two practice novels, right? And those get stuck in the closet. And the third one went to Harlequin. And so I did, you know, I started off in romantic suspense right. and I've been switching genres ever since. Right. So at this time in life, when most people are just sleep deprived and, <laughs> and, and complaining about how tired they are, you're writing your first novel. That's really kind of incredible. Well, you know, after working 80 to 100 hours a week as a medical doctor, um, right. being at home with a kid who slept a lot wasn't bad. <laughs> right, right. Hey, I got to say, because I was spying on you on Amazon today, some of those early romance novels still available. They're, <laughs> they're all, they're all available. That That is one of the, you know, it's, it's really funny. It's one of the, I guess, the benefits of the digital world is that right. books never really go out of print. So you can keep selling them. That's even right. if you're embarrassed by them. <laughs> right. Or even if you'd like to get the rights back, but that's never going to happen because they're no. not going out of print. Right. Gary, how about you? How'd you get into writing? I had two scientists, uh, uncles, and they influenced me to go to uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Uh, I studied, studied physics. Around my sophomore year, I had a course in advanced thermodynamics and said, I don't want to grow up to be a physicist. And I was writing at the time. I was a editor of the newspaper and the yearbook, and I started a humor magazine, and words came to me much more quickly, and I understood them than atomic particles. Wow. So I got an equivalent to an English degree and went to graduate school a couple of times, and um, what really, I wanted to write, and the only way to learn how to write is learn how to read, and the only way to learn how to read is to learn how to teach books to students. So I got a job at Northeastern, not Northwestern, Northeastern University. Oh, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Often. People that often confuse those. And my office mate was Robert B. Parker. Wow. <laughs> and is the closest friend for the 40 years. But I watched him write his first three or four, four or five Spencer novels. And he was a desperate mm -hmm. over here. And he demythologized the process. He wrote five pages a day. And at the end of the year, he had a book. He sent it off over the transom. He got it published. He got an, uh, an, an agent. And I got my first agent through him. So it was just watching him become the writer he became. And, um, and I followed that, uh, you know, I pursued that once I had a, a storyline and, uh, and wrote my first novel um, way back. Yeah. Wow. Both of you have kind of extraordinary <laughs> stories, Robert. Per Although I want to make sure everybody listening to this picked up on this. Your undergraduate degree was in physics, right? Undergraduate in physics, right? Yeah. I mean, most and, I, and I, I worked as a physicist for three years too while I was going to school. But I just knew, and it was very exotic stuff. But it was I didn't knew I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in a lab. <laughs> I wanted to write. Yeah. Uh, I mean, most writers I know have trouble rebooting their computers, and you've got a degree <laughs> in physics, and then the others were in English and writing and literature, right? Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about uh, your writing <laughs> process. Uh, you just mentioned five pages a day, and I think Tess referenced this too. Tess, what's your writing life look like? I mean, five pages a day, or what are you doing? You know, it's changed a lot over the years because now that I'm older and I don't have the fire in the belly to turn in a book every year, I decided that it was time to stop and smell the roses. So I don't sign contracts ahead of time. I just write the book and I turn it in. Really? Wow. Yeah, that's that's really changed. So I don't have deadlines. And the funny thing is, despite the fact I have no deadlines, I'm writing as fast as I ever did. So it's more of a psychological burden that's off my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And and my process is I don't outline. I just I, I hear a character. I want to follow that character. And I just start writing and I see where she takes me. OK, once again, you're just kind of 
flabbergasting me here. You don't outline. I mean, I associate you with these twisty, really pretty plot. Uh, you know, there's a lot of story here and twists and turns. And none of that's planned in advance? Always happens on the fly. It always, I mean, the best twists are the ones where it just comes out of left field and you go, whoa, I didn't see that happening. <laughs> because if it surprises me, it surprises the reader. And I think that if I see the twist on the page beforehand, um, somehow when I get to that, I'm just not as excited to write write about that twist. Interesting. Um, yeah, so it's it's all, my first drafts, of course, are, are horrible. They're a mishmash of, oh, I went down this blind alley and that blind alley. But by the time you finish the first draft, you know what the story is about, and you make it all hang together in the second, third, and fourth drafts. That's all. That's what well, I mean. I've had situations where I thought, okay, this story's a little slow. What's the most unexpected thing that could happen right now? And then I have it happen, but then I have to go back and spend like a week <laughs> rewriting the first part. So that makes the Vegas sort of sense. And I think, well, that's what happens when you don't plan ahead, Bill. But this is your, your this is your whole approach, right? Yeah, I, and I love that approach because I love being surprised by myself. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing that I should say, you know, this was like my second. If you'd asked me for a second writer's tip, I would have said this okay. one. Don't stop to revise. Just keep going. Just leave a little, put a sticky note and say, I've got to go fix this part. Let's just keep going. Uh, because I can't wait to get to the end of the first draft. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know what the story's about. So if I were to stop and revise, I'd be revising the first five chapters for months right. uh, and I'd never right. get any far. So I just, just keep on leaping ahead and just leaving stickies everywhere. Fix this, <laughs> fix that, go back to it later. Now I do understand and appreciate that one. I would never finish a first draft either. And the other benefit of that I've found anyway is that the whole time I'm writing the first draft, I think this is terrible. This is so bad. And then when I actually go back and read it, it's while not great, it's not as bad as I imagined it was at the time. Well, actually, but the first time I go back to look at it, it always is as bad as I imagined oh. it the first time. I can't remember which, which author it was that compared his first draft to a deformed baby. And he said every day he wakes up and that deformed baby is standing at his at the foot of his bed, you know, haunting him. Um, and that's how he sees that that first draft is it, it just needs a lot of work. Right. Well, Gary, how about you? What's your writing day look like? I, I do outline a little bit different uh, tack than uh, than Tess has. I do make a vague outline so I get some kind of direction, get a and, and get a, a skeleton that I put some flesh on. And. Unlike Tess, I polish my previous chapters because someplace down in chapter 27, I'm stuck. And the more I polish some of the earlier chapters, the more I'm able to work out the, the dilemmas I have later on. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that is oftentimes um, a, an exercise in confidence, too. If I can really buff the earlier chapters and feel good about it, Something kind of magical happens, and I, I untie the, the, the Gordian knot later on. I am two-thirds through a novel now, and two days ago I decided who the villain is, who the killer <laughs> is. And I, I, was, I was up against, you know, the, the, the rule of thumb is always take the least suspicious character of all your, of your, right. your, you know, of your characters. And another one is take the most suspicious character, dismiss that suspicion, try to put fingers on other people and come back to the original. Do you, do you, do you oh. remember the, the very popular show, the, um, the undoing with uh, Nicole Kidman and uh, Hugh Grant was, it was a, I think a six or seven part. Yes. Yes. It, it, it mm -hmm. starts off a of Hugh Grant. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And then they go down the line and all these other characters. Oh, and, you're right. and he did it. That's and, and that is an interesting strategy that I'm in process of toying with right now. Um, and but I, I, you know, so after I've gotten my um, my knot untied, I, I go to the end and then I do a final polish. Yeah. <laughs> I would worry that people would think, well, that's that's who they said it was all along and feel kind of mm -hmm. disappointed. I want the big Agatha Christie. <gasps> I never saw that coming moment. <laughs> <laughs> the, the trouble with Agatha Christie's I never saw that moment is it's very unfair yeah. a lot of the time. Yes. You know, she pulls stuff out of the hat yeah. at, the, at the end, and there's no way to really solve some of these Miss Marple crimes. Right, right. Um, <laughs> Except by thinking, as I think Christie often did, 
what would be the one thing nobody has even considered a possibility and then making it. And, and that was the that was the murder on the Orient Express. They all did it. <laughs> right. Everybody. Right. <laughs> that was brilliant, actually. <laughs> which which either it was brilliant or you feel sort of cheated because, <laughs> well, whichever one you picked was right. It was just there were 10 other people as right, well. Right. Right. <laughs> and the other thing is, I think that we think that we readers think they read these books because they want to solve the puzzle. Mm -hmm. They want mm -hmm. to find the killer. But that's not really why they read mm -hmm. the book. I mean, if they wanted to solve a puzzle, they would just get out the New York Times mm -hmm. crossword puzzle. Right. Um, they're really they're really reading it to find out who are these people and what moves them, and and you know just they're trying to find an emotional connection right, right. to characters. Right. Um, and it turns out that the puzzle is the least important part. Another of way of saying the de detective is more more interesting than the detection itself. Should be yes, exactly. I I enjoy a good puzzle, but. The one I'm going to remember most fondly isn't the one I figured out. It's going to be the one that completely fooled me or the one that I never saw coming or the one that had the most memorable character. So now I'm looking at two people. One says she doesn't outline. One <laughs> says he does. And somehow you manage to collaborate and produce a novel. I guess, Gary, there was a, an outline, but only you got to look at it. Or how, <laughs> Who wants to start? Tell me, where did this book come from? Um, Tess, you can take that. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll just tell you where they where right. they the concept came. Okay, from. Um, it was we were at a Christmas party. I mean, I've known Gary for for decades, yeah. and yeah. Um, we were at a Christmas party in Boston uh, at a bookstore, and I was following the Me Too movement and thinking about um, every story really is all about point of view. Wouldn't it be interesting to tell a Me Too kind of story, but in the in the sort of the gray zone from both the male and the female point of view? What if there's an illicit affair? Um, and what if maybe the man shouldn't be, well, neither one of them should be doing it, but what if the man is really trespassing? Um, what, how would he look at it? And how would the female look at it? Wouldn't it be fun to write a story like that where we actually split up the points of view? Um, and, and Gary said, yeah, let's do it. So he wrote the first chapter, sent it to me. I wrote the next chapter. And, and we went, we were going on this basic assumption that the young woman is going to die. We, we knew that already. Okay. So that was part of the future outline. Um, we knew she was going to be killed um, and that it was it was going to be murder. We just didn't know who did it yet. Um, and so the story proceeded from there. Um, we wrote it chronologically, starting off with the beginning of the affair, um, how it goes really badly, how she ends up dead. And then the cop comes in. And so that was the first draft. But I think we were feeling our way through a mm -hmm. lot of that, right. Gary. We were just I mean, the characters were, were mm -hmm. revealing themselves as right. we were writing right. the story. Even though this is a murder mystery, um, as, as Tess suggested, this really is um, a novel of character. Um, we have two complicated characters that we wanted to nuance. We didn't want to make either one villainous. Uh, we didn't want to make Karen a, 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 a hot temptress. We didn't want to make um, Jack a, a, a wanton um, uh, Lothario, a you know, womanizer. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and so the, the having to that determine what the motivations were just added layers, nuances to the characters. And uh, we really enjoyed that. I mean, we enjoyed the uh -huh. characters taking on flesh. And the most gratifying reviews we've gotten are those that said, this is very realistic characters, uh, that these are portraits mm -hmm. in gray, not black and white. So that's what we did. You're, you're making it sound sort of like the anti gone girl. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's. Yeah. Not taking anything away from the book that obviously sold well, but some people did find the characters maybe one dimensional and you're trying to take that two character. Can you believe any of them thing and and maybe flesh it out with people who you can sure, relate exactly. to or recognize? Uh, well, I think the scary thing is that we can relate to yeah. some of these characters. <laughs> You know, we can relate to the worst aspects of them because since I wrote a, from the point of view of the young woman who's she's the kind of woman maybe some of us know but never what really should not should stay away from <laughs> right. um, but, you know obsessive a stalking kind of girl who doesn't know how to take no for an answer when her boyfriend mm -hmm. breaks up with her we know people like that right so she was she was fun to write but I think Jack was a harder he was a harder right. nut to crack and I think that Gary had a much, much more difficult job because he had to make Jack, who had done something bad, he had to make him likable. He had to make him relatable. And 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 Gary knew just how to do it. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it worked out beautifully. I finished the book in about two days, found it to be an absolute page turner. And I also read a lot of fabulous reviews this morning. And I saw your Amazon ranking. So I think you're doing pretty. This must have turned out, you know, to be everything you want it to be and then some. So am I right in, 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 in that you just went through this first draft, alternating chapters back and forth and no big plan? And then what about the second draft? Oh. Did, did you get to revise <laughs> tests later in the game or third draft? <laughs> Well, look, first of all, that first draft was not, you make it sound like it was carefree. No, we didn't know who the killer was. We had to, we were like two thirds of the way through before we finally agreed on, on the killer because there were several possibilities. But what happened was because we wrote it chronologically, our edit, our wonderful editor, Gracie Doyle, looked at it and she said, you know, I really like this, this detective Frankie Loomis, who is the, she comes in two thirds of the way through the story. Mm -hmm. So uh, the editor said, can't we see her sooner? We would really like to see her sooner. Well, how do you bring in a detective when the murder doesn't take place until halfway through the story? So what um, what I chose to do was move the murder up to the very first scene. And a lot of it is flashback. So we see, we see that Taryn is dead, but then we go back to see how we got to this horrible point. And I, I, Gary's probably tired of hearing me say this, but it's like coming across a train wreck. And you want to know how that train got wrecked. So you go back and look at, at what happened, everything that led up to this wreck. And then at a certain point in the book, then you, then you watch the rest of the story. Turned out very well. So manuscripts, or you would naturally exchange paper, but electronic files right. going back and forth until everyone's mm -hmm. satisfied. Yeah. It was email. Yeah, mainly the editor. The yeah. editor was satisfied. <laughs> Well, well, that brings up another issue. Was there any resistance from the publishing world? Uh, Tess, you said you don't uh, do contracts in advance anymore. Was that the same same for this book? I didn't. Yeah, this this was written on spec. The, we finished it, and because it was a collaboration, my my usual publisher didn't know what to do with it, so they were reluctant, and that's why we ended up going to Thomas and Mercer uh, because they were willing to try something something new and different. I bet they were very glad to have both of you on the list. But, of course, uh, they're doing a lot of great deals these days. They are. They are. We've been very impressed. So what do you think? More collaborations, maybe? Or, or it, some of these, well, who could return? Anyway, more collaborations in the future? I won't even speak to that because I don't want to spoil uh, pro it. Probably, probably not. Uh, I mean, Tess has you know, several irons in the fire. I have a few irons in the fire. And so I, I think we've been probably this, this will be a one of it was greatly satisfying. We are both very proud mm -hmm. of this book, even though people are clamoring to see more of Frankie Loomis, but probably probably not in its collaboration. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, you know, it was we learned a lot from each other, too, I think, Again, not only about female versus male point of view, but. I think we learned how collaborations are really, it's, it's very, I like to liken it to trying to build a space station in space while you're both building your elements on earth. And you know what happens is that you send them both up and you find that the one has measured everything in millimeter and C and the other one has measured everything in inches and it doesn't quite, quite get together. So we had to get through that, that meshing this complicated machinery together, changing the time, the time element, and it ended up being like being, I feel like a Swiss watchmaker now. <laughs> so. Really? Putting all the pieces yeah, together? Right. Yeah. I mean, right. I, I tell you, I've published 55 books at this point, but I cannot even conceive of a collaboration. I think I'm way too much of a control freak to. <laughs> Most of us are. I, I mean, I think you know, are. I just, what? Yeah. Most novelists are. We're, yeah. We're, I like, want it my way. So how do you yeah. work with somebody else? Were there times when you just, now I'm trying to get the dirt, obviously. <laughs> Were there the times when you just had to I, 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 bite your tongue and say, I'll live with it. It, it? it comes from a writer who knows her audience and Tess knows her readership, 80 something percent female. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, you have these psyche sensitive to the female re point of view and we're receiving a book. So some of the stuff that I had written, maybe some kind of, husband-wife jokes that were of a slightly racy, racy nature I probably ended up in the cutting room floor because I think, you know, it's perceived as being a little bit too much. Our style is a little different. You, you can tell from the, just talking to Tess, she is very precise, very concise. 
I have a t- tendency mm-hmm. to telescope the moment and have my main character ruminate on, on on the moment and consequences. And you know, so I think our styles were were a little bit different. But I deferred to her, and and she when she said, I think you should either shorten or lengthen the scene. I responded, and she did the final edit and and just kind of bucked the stone so that it looked like one author with two at least two separate voices. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that what helps is that you have to respect each other as writers right. or at least real, realize you're, you're dealing with a professional. And when there is a, um, a difference of opinion, we have to always think about the audience. Uh, and that was I think that was probably the point of most that was most contentious was would a woman read that chapter mm-hmm. and get ticked off? And we did yeah. not want to tick off our, our no. readers because no. we knew they were 80 percent female. Um, so that, that, I had to tone down some of the some of the the jackets, <laughs> I guess I could say. <laughs> some of the guy point of view that I would have been offended hearing as a reader. So I think that was that was about it. It was it was mainly about whether or not we would we would upset our readership. Mm-hmm. Sounds like a fascinating thing to do and and challenging too. Of course, here's my brilliant segue. You two have both tackled challenging subjects in the past. Gary, this is my way of leading to talking about Tunnel Vision, one of your previous books, which I adore, which kind of addresses the issue of the afterlife. And among other people, was uh, praised by many people, um, among them Ray Bradbury, who you can't see it, but my picture of Bradbury is right there. (laughs) (laughs) If I'd gotten that review, I probably would have... I. would have just stopped because it would never get any better than that. Anyway, tell me about Tunnel Vision. How how did the idea for tackling this come about? I was at a cocktail. But co- great things happen at cocktail parties. I was at a cocktail Apparently, party. I need to get out more. <laughs> and a woman said that she had a near-death experience. She is Jewish. She had a near-death experience and had died and woke up in a place where Jesus was standing. It was the iconic you know, Renaissance images of, of, of Jesus. And she had lost her baby and wanted to die in, in real life. And Jesus told her, go back to life. You have one other child who depends on its mother. And this was just so fascinating to me. And I decided that an interesting thing to do would be some neurologist takes uh, volunteers and, and um, for three minutes flatlines them and wires up their brain to see if the mind separates from the matter, mind separates from the brain. And if there is a, a, some indication, then it might in- indicate that the mind goes someplace in death, um, which would be an indication um, that there is an afterlife. And, and that was the kind of genesis of mm-hmm. it. And it was this great fun doing the research and uh, you know mm-hmm. that uh, it, it turned out pretty pretty good and the, the Bradbury quote was you know died and gone to heaven I mean, it was the last Ray Bradbury gave very few blurbs very few endorsements in his life and that was the last right. of his life I said I can't think of another time that uh, I, I, I saw him right, endorse right. Right. that's yeah. and, and then he passed away but we, so it's, it's quite an honor of course yeah well well deserved it's Thank a great you. book Tess, uh, you, of course, started this series of books with Zoli and Isle, which later became the television series, two female leads at a time when that was, would it be fair to say, not the norm in <laughs> cop shows or probably anywhere else. Where did these characters come from? Um, they, they <laughs> sprang to life on their own. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. sort of like, like I started Again, I, st- I started off by hearing Jane Rizzoli's voice, and she was in the first book called The Surgeon. And I introduced more Isles in the second book because she was essentially me. I mean, I was just channeling myself really? uh, as more well, Isles in book two. She's the and medical I, examiner, right? So yeah, she's the medical examiner. I didn't, and she's a little bit like me. She's very logical, kind of an introvert. And I did not see this becoming a series. It was more, oh, I, I wrote about Jane and let's see what happens next to her. And then let's see what happens to Mora. And then before I knew it, I was, I was in the middle of a series. So um, a, lot of the, a lot of the series had to do with wanting to just see what happens to these women. I mm-hmm. want to know, does Jane ha- get happy? Does she get married? Does she ever have her baby? 
poor Jane, it took her like three books to have her baby. <laughs> um, and then it's, you know, Mora, she falls in love with the priest. What happens to that affair? And that takes books and books to resolve that affair. Really all about following your girlfriends on the page. <laughs> I gotcha. Well, that turned out all right. Gary mentioned that no one knows their audience better than you do, I think he said. So do you have a sense of not just who they are, but, but why they're reading your books? What are they responding to? What is it they're looking for when they pick up a new Tess Gerritsen? Well, I'm, they're looking for Tess Gerritsen, actually. <laughs> They, they tell me how much they love the blood and gore and they just want, they love the mystery. They love, they love to be scared. Mm -hmm. um, and they're 80% female. I, I came to this conclusion a long time ago that when, when we read books, when women read books, who do we identify with? We don't identify with the hero. We don't identify with Jane Mazzoli necessarily. Mm -hmm. We identify with the victim. The victim is who we put ourselves, we put ourselves in their feet. And that's why these books are both scary and somehow they feel triumphant at the end because um, the killer is, is, is killed by the end or arrested by the end. It's the same thing with children's scary literature. I find mm -hmm. that kids are most interested in books in which the potential victims are children. If the victims are adults, kids don't care about that as much anymore. So we really buy books in which we can see ourselves as the victim. And it, it has something to do with why. All these crime novels have women's faces on the covers. Yeah, it's right. because the audience is mostly female, and the and the female audience is looking for a book in which they feel that they can face danger but safely get out of it. Now, one of the mm -hmm. interesting things that's, is that that's, that's, that bookstores don't make a distinction between mysteries and thrillers, and sometimes they lump together. Yeah, you know, the mystery right. slash thriller, but a mystery, as you said earlier, Bill, is 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 problem solving. It, it, you're solving a puzzle. Uh, and it's kind of driven by logic and rational thinking. A, a thriller is driven by dread. And it's exactly what is the appeal in, in Tess's books, the, the element of dread. Something bad is going to happen to somebody, and you can identify with that. And particularly if it's a first person who is the, the, the potential victim. I mean, dread is an emotion. And the, the sense of something horrible about to happen to me is very real and very relatable. So... Particularly, you know, if you read the headlines in a newspaper, we, we live in a, in a dreadful, filled world. And, and so that is something that is really the, the secret of, of books like, like Tess's. Yeah. I neglected to say earlier, so let me say now to anybody who is listening to this live, you are very invited to pose questions to Tess or Gary or both. Just type it into the chat box and we'll forward that along. In the meantime, you both have done a lot of writing. You're both well into the two-digit numbers. Can you think of any sort of writing lessons you've learned along the way or maybe something you didn't know when you started, but you figured out probably by doing it or doing it wrong or <laughs> something like that? Tess, I see you nodding. What did you got? Well, number one is it never gets easier. It just, you know, I just finished my 30th book and it was just as hard as, the, as number five. Yeah. Um, what I do find is that it helps to be incredibly curious to always be paying attention to, to odd things, odd stories, whether it's true crime or clippings. I mean, I have, I have a folder of, of tear sheets that I pull out of magazines or newspapers. And I don't always know what I'm going to do with these articles, but eventually they come back to me. And I, I remember uh, some of my best books actually came out of, out of something that came out in the newspaper. I mean, yeah. I, I wrote, I read this story out of the Boston Globe in the suburban section about a a woman who was found dead in her bathtub and they put her in a body bag and sent her to the morgue and she woke up in the body bag. Wow. So, you know, I had that tear sheet for a while. I didn't know what to do. And then eventually I thought, oh yeah, I remember this. This is a great opening for this book. Um, I also find that sometimes if you get like two disparate articles, you put them together and that combination yeah. becomes a new plot. Right. Stronger than either of them by themselves. Right. Gary, how about you? Lessons you've learned along the way? Um, shorten my 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 narrative, <laughs> and this is what something I learned from Tess right. also, and also over the years have been you know developing uh, a, a a more concise style. The earlier books were big, the long. People don't run or want to read a five hundred page book anymore. You know, three hundred pages or so, plus or minus a few, is is a comfortable length. And so I, I learned how to to streamline better than I had when I first started. And in fact, there's a special privilege that the first three books I wrote 
when they went on when they went digital, I was given the opportunity to edit my original my first book. And my first book, I took out seventeen thousand words. I mean, it was you know, I was showing off. It was you know, it was it was yeah, clunky phrases, too many adjectives, too many adverbs, all this stuff I warned my students not to do. And that was a, uh, a wonderful turning point. It's like 30 years after I'd written the book, I had this opportunity to, to clip it down. And uh, it, it, you know, it had, had gotten mm-hmm. that narrative thrust that was kind of lacking in the original form. Mm-hmm. Wow. And that is why I will never edit my, never even read my yeah. early work, much less... <laughs> Edit it. Gary, you're still yeah, teaching, yeah, right? Uh, at that North University, at whatever. University, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes. I, I teach. Uh, teaching fiction writing and a lot of other literature-based yes, classes, right? Yes, I teach right? a course in fiction writing. I had them start a novel, write the first two or three chapters, uh, and perhaps if they can, an outline, uh, a, a synopsis. And I teach a course in horror fiction, uh, which is going into its 40th year. And then... Other semesters will be either science fiction and writing or, or modern bestsellers in the writing course. So the, the, the constant is uh, the fiction writing, which I absolutely love. And it's small. It's a, you know, it's a, mm-hmm. a seminar, 15 students, and you learn a lot about, about students, a lot about people. And it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a fun course to teach. Yeah. yeah, I think your students learn a lot. Tess, I read that you are breaking into filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, yeah. My son and I just finished our second film together. We, we did a horror film a couple of years ago. But this year, this film is a, is a documentary, a feature documentary about the origins of the pig taboo. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. uh, we, we look into religion and, um, and environmentalism and also the, the centuries long relationship between humans and pigs, both good and bad. And it's, it's playing in a couple of film festivals this year. And that's a magnificent beast, right? That's, that's what a magnificent beast. So, film festivals now next week on Netflix is or next well, year. We, perhaps. PBS is, has uh, taken it on into their library, so it could be on PBS starting uh, in, mm. late, in the winter. That's fantastic. Okay, we've got a couple questions now from people who are watching. This yeah. one, I'll do the top one first because it's shorter. This is from Anne. She's asking. How have your readers changed over the years? Hmm. Tess, I remember your first book was in 1987, yeah. I think. Yeah. That beats me by four years. How have your readers changed? I think readers in general probably have shorter attention spans. They also yeah. have more options. There's television. Yes. You know, TV has gotten so good and have, there's so much to watch on TV. So it's it's more of a struggle to keep their attention. So I think it's it's almost as if we have to be um, more on point in our books. I have to pass this along, Tess. Uh, someone else watching this, her name is Karen, is suggesting that uh, the, the films you're doing with your son are his reward for sleeping way back <laughs> when he was young. <laughs> so you could write your books. <laughs> Well, you know what? My son is wonderful, and he's and he's a, he's a delight to work with as a filmmaker. Mother son things could fall apart; and it could be really a disaster. But it is it is just a privilege to be working with him. He's a great director. He's a great cinematographer, and he's a very good editor. So, <laughs> Gary, how about you? How have you how have you seen readers change over I, the years? What I said earlier, the I think the attention span is a little shorter. I think they want something a little faster, um, and so that is you know that is I'm aware of that. And I think I picked up more female um, readers. Uh, I think the earlier books are read by guys. And as the demographics have changed, uh, you know, more women buy books than, you know, than, than men. In fact, uh, I think 80% of the books that are sold are, are by females. And, um, and so you know, I, I, I learned how to address that particular audience and make the books a little bit mm-hmm. slimmer. You know, I, I think that's really interesting. As I think I just said, <laughs> when... I, my first book was in 91, and I remember my publisher saying, you need to do this or that because it's a thriller and most of your readers will be men. I have never found that to be true. Uh, I, I might not go as high as 80, maybe 70 percent. And that's not just now. That's always. Uh, all, uh, is New York just not understand who's reading their books? Or <laughs> There's a funny breakdown with gender. I think mm-hmm. men are more... Male male authors are more likely to have a higher proportion of male readers and women the other way. But what I have discovered is that 
Okay, I have a, I have a story to tell. Um, okay. I, <laughs> I was on book tour and I was in a, a Costco or something, and there was a man buying picking up thrillers. And um, my media escort said to him, why don't you pick up Tess Gerritsen's thriller? She's, she's standing right here and she can sign for you. And he looked at me and he goes, I don't buy books by women. Mm. And I looked at the books he was holding and I knew because of my editorial connections mm -hmm. that he was buying books by female ghostwriters. Oh, he just wow. didn't know he was writing. He was didn't buying know. books by women. He, they just had men's names on them. So um, I, I think that there's one thing I found is that men, women will cross over and buy books by both genders, but there's a large proportion of men who will not mm. buy books by women. Mm. That's interesting. And it explains, Gary, I know you used to read, uh, probably still do read science fiction, but there was a time when virtually every woman writing in that field adopted some kind of lots of initials or male sounding right. pseudonym. And I guess this yeah, is why. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I think the breakthrough was probably Ursula Le Guin, um, and she yes. she not only had good science fiction, but really smart characterization and great writing style. And she was, you know, she was, she was a terrific writer. But you're right. Though. Whereas in mystery, of course, at least going back to the golden age, it's if not dominant, there were many prominent female writers, but maybe not so much in the thriller world. We got another question. This is from somebody watching this on Facebook who says, for both of you basically, what advice would you give an older person who has hobby written for a long time about breaking into print as a new writer today? You're probably thinking like me that you're not a new writer if you've been hobby writing for a long time, but you get what she's saying. She's older. She wants to break into writing. What advice could you give her? I would say it is never too late. And I can think of a couple of examples of people who hit the bestseller list with their initial book, their very debut book in their mm -hmm. 80s. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I remember there's a book called And the Ladies of the Club. I think she was in her 80s and living in a nursing home when she sold her book and it became a bestseller. And was it, is it the, where the Crawdads say, yeah. um, yeah. Delia, Crawdads, Owens. Delia Owens, wasn't she 80 or something before yeah. 70 when she died? She's, um, yeah. That but was it's also the, the late Not maker, yet. I think she was 81 years old. Remember that was a big bestseller about eight or nine years ago, the lace maker. Um, well, you know, the, what I love these stories also, because I think older people have this, the benefit of wisdom. They have the benefit of, of, of having lived a life and they have such stories to tell. It's, it's just a matter of being, being, you know, good at your craft of being able to use your craft to tell these stories in, in a way that makes the rest of us sink into your story. So age has nothing to do with it. It, I think it's craft all the way, whether you're young or old. It's just that I think if you're older, you have the benefit of experience. Right. So age, not an issue, but how is she going to break in? What, any tips or suggestions you could give? It might be. It, well, we both, done it, yeah, we both done it the traditional way with agents, but that's not yeah. necessary. And also anymore. it might be easier just to, to self-publish because the conventional publisher is looking for someone who's going to have a kind of longevity and write a lot of books and you know, maybe one a year or so. And the, 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 all the, all the, Houses on the waterfront in New York are, are just, you know, flooded with manuscripts coming in. So this very well built, because I'm sure you give advice on this, but self-publishing is nothing to, it's, it's still, re it's quite respectable. And some bestsellers have come out of publishers and self-published people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, today, not once upon a time, right? I have heard people I've worked with <laughs> say, you know, people who have gray hair as do i <laughs> say i don't want to spend the next 10 years hunting down an agent so that's how i'm gonna you know so i'll self-publish or do right. something like that which i get people just have to understand what it is they really right. want right i would still i would still make the initial attempt to get an agent just because i think that self-publishing mm -hmm. is a lot of work <laughs> and maybe what you if if your if your book is good enough um, you will find that having having a publishing house behind you can really take that burden off you and possibly get you a lot more money too. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. Somebody, uh, some astute listener has noticed that you both have science backgrounds and want to know if you find your so-called former life interferes with reading. 
or I'm going to guess writing. What do you think? I find that my former life enhances the research aspect of what I write. If I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm doing something that's got science in it, I know how to ask questions of, of experts in various fields of science and just get me from A to B and let me sound like I know what I'm talking about. So I, I have enough of an acumen of you know, understanding what they're talking about or where to go to go more deeply into the science. And that, 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 work, that works for me. I never once, in the 40 plus years I've been teaching college English, never once ever regretted having a science background. I mean, because I had read science right. fiction by the pound as a kid, they asked, could I come up with way back, could I come up with a uh, jazzy new course, as they called it, that would bring non-English majors and taking English electives. And I said, how about science fiction? They all kind of gagged a bit because back then it, had, <laughs> it was, you know, before all the, right. you know, the, uh, the, the kids who parents put in the closet when company came over. You know? So, it, you know, this right. is a, you know, that was, a, and I never much regretted having that background. It does help. Yeah, well, first of all, I agree that having a science background makes research a snap. But um, ha- being a doctor, it does pull me out of a story, I have to admit, when I see something that's, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll read a book and somebody will mistake a neurologist for a neurosurgeon. And it doesn't, they sound kind of like the same, but they're completely different things. <laughs> or a cardiologist with a cardiothoracic surgeon. I see that and I think, oh, this person has no idea what they're talking about. So then it, it makes you feel like you're not going to trust them for the rest of the story. Right. Um, so that, that, that does bother me. But then on the other hand, I also read um, books where the story is so good, I can overlook it. Yeah, um, but it is a it is a a wall that you have to get past if you don't know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Ted. I think that's what our correspondent was actually going for. I abridged the the long question, but I think her point was: as much as you know about science, is that a stumbling block when you're reading somebody who hasn't done as much research as maybe? Okay, yeah, I, I get that too. Yeah. But that said, even though we are both science backgrounds, we make mistakes. <laughs> and I make mistakes. And usually they have to do with firearms. Yeah, I'm sure there are people who are like, you know, gun people and they read our books and they get mad at us for getting powder wrong or something. Oh, man. My characters just pull out a gun, period. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Any yeah, more I'm information, sure. that's just going to get me in trouble. I just use the word weapon. I don't, I don't, I don't specify what kind of gun it is. Yeah. Yeah. What difference does it make? Uh, Tess, I think people are going to beat me up if I don't ask you about all the, the media experience you've had with the, the television series. And I, I think you've been involved in that. What's that been like? Let's start with that. What was it like seeing these characters, you know, become an ongoing series that ran for some time? Well, it was a thrill, even though they didn't look at all like my characters. Yeah. And that's, that's what happens. You know, you write this book and you have people that you really know, you think you know them, and they show up on TV and all of a sudden mm-hmm. they're gorgeous and they're not at all the way you, you, you thought they would be. But it was still a privilege to see them on television. I didn't have anything to do with the show other than having written the books that they're based on. And mm-hmm. I was signed up to be on one episode in the last season, which was fun. I'd been, I was on this, I was on set for two two different episodes. Um, but I had the best job of all with Rizzoli and Dials. I was, I was contracted to be a paid consultant mm-hmm. um, for every episode. They never asked me anything. And I still don't. <laughs> Sweet. Did you want to be more involved? If they had, would you? No, no. <laughs> yeah, I had, they were very, con- they were very good. The showrunners were, were fantastic. They always invited me to go into the writer's room and, and help them break story. But I had book deadlines at that point, and there was no way I could do anything else but deal with the books. I get that. Well, with considerable regret, I probably need to wind this down. But before I do, let me both ask, what should we expect next? What's coming next from Tess and Gary? Tess, you want to go? Um, I just finished my 13th Rizzoli and Dials book. It's Mm. called Listen to Me, and it's coming out in June of 2022. And I'm I'm working on another book right now with a new character um, about spies. Do you think will will there become a point where you're tired of these series characters? I'm talking about Rizzoli and Isles, or or are they going to go off <laughs> forever into the sunset? I have no no plans to send them <laughs> off into the sunset, but I, I keep I keep expanding their universe so that this this next book is going to focus a lot on Jane's mother, Angela, who's a suburban housewife in Revere and 
what did she really see out her window? So <laughs> that's yeah. focus of that story. Yeah. Gary, what's next from you? called Served Cold, as in Revenge is Best Served Cold. That is a title right. of a fictional author who's whose third book is promising to be the big breakout book and get him into bestsellerdom. It is absolutely savaged in the New York Times book review. And the re reviewer has his own motives. He is up for tenure at his university and is trying to impress the deans and a tenure committee that he could savage a book and, and, and accuse it of dumbing down America. The, the writer, uh, the author, sees his savaging review and it just, it, it, sets up a concatenation of more negative reviews. He loses the contract of the next book, destroys his dreams, destroys everything he's been hoping for, and he goes after the reviewer. And their lives in mm. intermingle in a very dark way. So served cold. No, no, pub no publication date yet. Uh, uh, sounds true. Well, when it does come out, that'll be the excuse to bring you back onto <laughs> the podcast, both of you, or bring you to WriterCon one way or the other. Hey, Thank you both so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you. This Bill. was fun. Good luck with Splitsville. You bet. Thank you. Great appreciate luck. that. Just a few parting words to everybody watching this podcast. Please don't forget to register for WriterCon, which takes place on Labor Day weekend. That's September 3rd through 6th. Let me also remind you that this podcast is ad-free. We're supported by our patrons. I have that site on the Patreon website. It's Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com forward slash Wilburn, W I L L B E R N, where you can support this podcast. And believe me, even if you just contribute a little bit, it makes a huge difference. Please rate or review this show wherever you get podcasts. It makes it easier for new listeners to discover us and always looking for new writers who might be looking for just the thing they need to launch their writing career to the next level. Until next time. Hey, sneakers, keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time.